When buying something new, it can be tempting to choose the cheapest option. But as we all know, a low price often means poor quality. When you consider the whole life cycle cost of a product, buying things that simply don't break will be the best option, both financially and environmentally. That's why Vestra's goal is to produce furniture that lasts forever. When our designers approach a new design, sustainability is a key factor. Therefore, we use short haul materials of the best quality. Slow growing in its cold Nordic environment, Scandinavian pine gets extra hard. This makes it exceptionally durable and well suited for outdoor use. Nordic steel is hot dip galvanized and powder coated to meet Norwegian offshore standards. The steel production generates 30% lower greenhouse gas emissions than the world average. Having taken such measures to select the best materials, we do not hesitate to offer a lifetime guarantee against rust and a 15-year guarantee on wood and paint. Vestra offers spare parts for all the furniture we've ever made. After many years of use, worn out furniture can be returned to our factory for restoration and reuse. So that's how our products last forever and ever and ever. This aids Vestra on our way to becoming the most sustainable furniture company in the world. Our products may cost a little bit more, but in the end, if you consider the whole life cycle cost, we believe no one can beat us. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to July's FICA. Um, it's great to see you here. Not everybody's on holiday, obviously, although I think uh, much of the world is, to be fair. It seems very quiet at the moment. Um, this month, we're really having a very relaxed conversation about SDG 10, reduced inequalities. No presentations today at all. We're going to be talking um, in a very uh, relaxed manner shortly. Um, we're particularly going to be discussing target 10.2, which is by 2030 to empower and promote the social, economic and political inclusion of all, irrespective of age, sex, disability, race, ethnicity, origin, religion or economic or other status. And we're going to be joined by Jane Fortescue, who is Principal Landscape Architect at FPCR Environment and Design, and Ruth Lin Wong Holmes, who is a Design Principal for the Landscape and Public Realm at the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park and the London Legacy Development Corporation. And we'll be having a conversation about the difficulties of being yourself in the workplace when you're a member of a minority group. Um, I'll be giving my uh, views as a not a member of a minority group, but as similar issues that I've encountered as a woman, um, which is a little bit surprising given that we're at least 50% of the population. Um, but anyway, covering the protected characteristics of race, sexuality and gender in particular today, we want to explore the everyday difficulties that so many people face. And maybe more importantly, um, find ways to reduce these real or perceived inequalities and uh, try and find out how it feels when you can't actually be you um, anywhere, really, but particularly in the workplace. So welcome to Jane and Ruth. I'm Romy. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the commercial director here at Vestra in the UK. And I should just mention that we're recording this webinar for catch up purposes. It will be added to YouTube shortly. So um, if you want to come back online, Ruth and Jane, that would be great. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hello. So I'm just going to run through a little bit of background and then we'll move on to um, questions that we've already prepared. But please do add anything that you're thinking of to the chat. And I believe there may be a function where I can allow people to speak. So I might try that. <laughs> it, might, it might go horribly wrong, but we'll maybe give that a go. Um, and I think um, people may, you know, feel that the SDG doesn't necessarily relate to us here in the UK, and we're probably much less affected than many other countries globally. Um, but it is about reducing inequalities within and among countries um, based on income, sex, age, disability, sexual orientation, race, all of those points that I mentioned earlier. And although we may be less affected, it's, it, these inequalities still 
uh, threaten long-term social and economic development and prevent the reduction of poverty and often destroy people's sense of fulfilment and self-worth. So we can't ever achieve sustainable development and make the planet better for everyone if many people are still excluded from this chance of having a better life. Um, and that's a pretty important statistic. I think two in 10 people reporting personal experience of discrimination on one of these protected characteristics. And when you think that inequality is growing for more than 70 percent of the global population, it's exacerbating divisions and hampering this economic and social development. And COVID-19 has just made this worse. So we have to do what we can to ensure equalities achieved um, for a life of dignity for everybody. Um, it needs to be universal and pay particular attention to the needs of disadvantaged and marginalised communities. And uh, for me, and I, I think that will come out as we, as we have a chat, um, the particular impact of this subject on people's mental health is of real interest. I qualified as a mental health first aider a couple of months back. And so some of the quotes on the following um, slides relate back to that. So please do add your questions. I'm sure you've got many. Um, add, add them into the chat and we'll pick those up as we go along. And uh, I'd like to just start, I think, with you, Jane. This this top um, quote was, yeah. well, two, two actually, they, I put them together, but they came from you. And yeah. as much as I kind of feel it's funny. It's, I mean, it's really not. So yeah. I just wonder if you want to explain your everyday struggles with people <laughs> asking you these kinds of questions. Yeah, I think, I think the thing is with, with discrimination, certainly around LGBT, is people have an idea or a preconceived image of what a gay woman or a gay man is going to be like. And if you don't fit into that box, you kind of make them feel a bit uncomfortable and a bit you know, unsure of how to treat you or how to be. So those two comments, I mean, if I had a pound for every time someone had said I didn't look gay, almost like it was a compliment. I mean, <laughs> yeah. And you just, it kind of makes you think, well, what, what is that? What is that to you? And why do I need to look that way for you to be able to say you were this or that? And I think mm -hmm. it very much comes down to the boxes that people feel comfortable with you being in. Um, and that second comment, about wearing a man's watch was one of the strangest that was at work that happened that conversation and I'd if I just tell the story I'd gone outside to talk to my partner on the phone we were away at an industry event and I'd come back in into the restaurant and there was a group sat around a table that I was with all all chaps and they were all giggling like they were at school and I thought okay something happens a bit odd and then and then, oh no, you ask her, you ask her. And it was this joke that I wasn't in on. Um, and basically they, one person that was aware that I was, I was a lesbian had said, oh, she's out talking to her girlfriend. And they all thought that was hilarious and all cracking up with laughter. And one of them said, oh, is that why you wear a man's watch? Now, it's such a nothing comment. It doesn't, you know, no, mm. I, I just like the watch, but it, immediately highlighted me as different mm. and I wasn't one of them and I was getting laughed at and there was a joke that I wasn't in on because of my sexuality and that's not that's not okay I mean granted I asked him why he wore such tight trousers and then there was a lot of jokes <laughs> after that but you brush these things off I was a mm. 21 year old in a group of guys that I didn't really know that well and it's not okay mm. No, I think I think that's the point. And I think, um, you know, what we really would like to do today is not just talk about it. This has come from both Ruth and Jane. You know, it's we can talk as much as we like and we can all say, oh, it's terrible and, you know, it, it needs to stop. But we need to find ways to address it. And I think both of you have really made a, a bold stance um, doing exactly that. And it, it's about just being more open, essentially, isn't it? I think in the first instance. And Ruth, I picked up on you particularly because I've known of you, not known you well for some years. And I noticed, I think it was on LinkedIn that your name suddenly changed. Um, and I wonder, you know, and I didn't really think much of it. And I thought, oh, maybe you got married or I, I don't know, you know, I mean, that was all I thought of it really. And then when we got talking, I realized that there was actually quite a big, meaningful um, event behind that. And I wonder if you want to share that as your background. Yeah. And 
thank you for picking up on that because it was a really big moment for me putting my full name as per my birth certificate on um, onto social media platforms and everywhere else and actually sort of talking about it at work. I think it's, my mother is um, from China, Chinese origin from Singapore um, and I was given Lin Wong as the names related to her. She passed away a couple of years ago and at that point there was also the Black Lives Matter and I was just thinking a lot more about why don't I use my full name? I remember when I was six years old I was really proud that I had a Chinese mum and an English dad and I was teased at school and I think at some point I was pushed and sort of shoved around and I was told sort of things I needed to talk about and say, you know, all Chinese people were great innovators, you know, the Great Wall of China, all sorts of things to fight that. But I noticed after that, on all my notebooks, on everything, I had kind of scrubbed out Lin Wong from my name. And, and it was only until then I suddenly realised when she'd gone, I wasn't honouring her and my heritage. And I'd been hiding it for so long and it felt awful. Mm. So I, and um, but do you know what? Bringing it back in is such a pain because everything we do, whenever you fill in a form anywhere, I never know where to put the, the names. Mm. So do I put it Lin Wong Holmes or Lin Wong Wong Holmes, or and you just realize that systemically, even filling in a form mm. is really tricky when you have more names because that's what you're, you know, that's what you've been given and that's part of your identity and that's part of your heritage and all those things you can't even fill in a form without being slightly perplexed by the whole process. Mm. Or confusing uh, being at risk of confusing people or you know the wrong order or, yeah exactly yeah yeah and i think it's these it's these really insidious simple things that people say or that you come across every day that actually just build and build don't they it's it doesn't have to be anything major or dramatic and, and a one-off uh, aspect of your life. I, th I think it is just this constant drip, drip, drip of, I don't know, you know, sometimes maybe uh, as it says on some of these slides, you know, it could be perceived, but you just don't know. You, you're left wondering if if something's happened because of this. And unless you're open and actually call some of these things out, you'll never know. Um, and Jane, you, you've talked about finding allies um, and and people not being afraid to ask questions, not being afraid to to just have conversations. But I think both of you have been clear that you know that's important. Uh, so how how can you reassure people that don't want to sort of put their foot in it? I suppose by by asking awkward things, or I don't know, just being nosy, maybe even think, that's I me. Think can, <laughs> so. can yeah, I think there's quite a, quite a balance between a nosy Parker and someone that's actually interested and wants to learn. Mm. Um, we've done at work for Pride Month, we've we sent a load of quite educational emails around. We've got a little LGBT network um, and to try and start a conversation. So talking about mm. things like pronouns, because it's something that's a lot more prominent now on LinkedIn. You can you can identify and that sort of thing so it's it's more visible and people don't want to ask and they don't want to do it because they're kind of a bit like well but if I'm not trans or if I'm this like, I don't want to offend anyone but I think proactively trying to engage and discuss elements like that I mean for me around LGBT I'm also quite keen with the the kind of female element the women in, in workplace and trying to get people to see the issues that there are and I think when you're comfortable in your privileged bubble and we all, you know, everyone has that to a point, you don't think about another person's experience. So mm. it's about opening doors for conversations to be had. And for me personally, trying not to take offence, it's very easy if you feel like you've been discriminated against for a long time to be prickly and... I think the prickliness is almost dangerous to getting people to engage. So it's it's very mm. hard to dismiss it and put it to the back. But if you want to take the role of an advocate, I think you you've got to you know accept that you're going to be talking to some people that are going to say stuff that actually is a bit offensive. But you need to mm. educate them. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I know you said, Ruth, that your workplace is particularly supportive. Um, 
can you share some ways in which you see that and you and you feel that um you know you feel supported in in uh, just being you yeah i think it was really great that the uh, london legacy development corporation were really keen when we started a bame leaning group um and i do remember sort of sitting in our middle of our office and there's one room which could could accommodate the amount of people who were happy to be in that group and it felt like a goldfish bowl and we were all feeling a bit scared, like people are going to say, they, those are the awkward people who are going to ask awkward questions, who are going to raise awkward things. And we all knew that we would be sitting there and raising things and getting some people rolling their eyeballs like, oh, it's them again, bashing on about this stuff. Mm. But they, we carried on going and Black Lives Matter stuff blew up and was just incredible. And it was tiring and emotional and all those sort of things. But we knew that senior management really genuinely were curious and wanted to know what our experience were and certainly for the black people who were in that group it's just been transformation in terms of their listening and action that's been happening with you know uh, um, black history month reading um reading book book clubs and genuinely people coming along because they've been invited in and they are curious to learn about mm -hmm. Uh, the experience people happening so it's amazing but I remember someone many years ago I was in an office of about 40 people and we had one um, administrator who was black and she turned to me one day and she goes it's really weird here nobody asks me about anything about my background or anything and and she goes I think it might be because I'm black and I sort of went you know what I think we're probably so worried about saying mm. the wrong thing to you that we haven't and I feel mm. so because genuinely I'm quite interested and mm. but I think when it comes from a point of curiosity and interest and learning and it's delivered in that way people are actually really quite happy to talk about it and and it's mm. fascinating and and it brings so much more to your workplace so so I think to be an advocate is is a brave step because you're right you might ask someone on a bad day where they think oh actually I don't really want to talk about anything there's too much going on but equally you take that moment when it is brilliant and a whole thing, you know, opens up and you just find out their lived experience is fascinating and different and and sometimes hard and sometimes amazing. So, yeah. Mm. No, it's really interesting. And I think it is about action, isn't it? It's, you know, as I said before, really, we've, we've got to do more. We can't, we can't keep talking about it. I think that's the case for so many of the subjects that we cover actually in, in the FICA sessions. You know, you, there's no point just sitting here for an hour and having a nice chat about it. You know, it is what's next. What can we do? And all of this for us is in the context of uh, the SDGs. Um, but it is just about making the place better you know, making our lives better in, in whatever way I think we can contribute. And I think, I mean, the only thing that I can talk about with any experience of is, is being a woman in pretty much a, a man's sector. And um, it, it is exhausting. I've, I've found on occasion it's absolutely exhausting. Just, you know, you see things and you let so much of it go by and then you think, no, that's enough. And uh, that kind of being, you know, being willing to call it out on every occasion, you know, and the point is, it's not about what just happened that day or what somebody just said to you. It, it you might've had a bad day for all sorts of reasons and, and just don't have the energy to deal with that, that day, day at that time. So I think people need to appreciate, you know, you do need time out sometimes as well from, from sort of carrying the torch, don't you? Which is a yeah. good euphemism currently for the Olympics, I guess. <laughs> When you get to the stage, this is quite, this is what's quite interesting. When you get to the stage of calling it out, often you're so cross that yeah. your reaction yeah. isn't going to be, you know, you're going to have, it's going to be lots of things unless mm. it's an open conversation. And I think there's a couple of points is that if you're asking questions of someone, if you're interested in someone, you've got to have an element of humility. Even if you go and say, you know what, I might get this wrong. I'm really sorry. And just be so clear that you want to learn and I think that's if I was talking about about gay stuff and someone said that to me and they say look you know I'm this is I'm sure this wouldn't happen now but this is the first time I met a gay person can you tell me about it I'm a lot more likely to um kind of forgive those those things that they say that maybe would be a bit insensitive mm, mm. Um, but what you're saying about calling stuff out as well 
there's is almost the smaller stuff that needs calling out more than the bigger stuff mm. so the big you know the big moment of someone saying you know I don't think gay people should be allowed to have children or whatever everyone's like whoa you can't say that mm-hmm. but people coming into my work and asking me what my husband does is more damaging at a low level constantly to me than some idiot with openly homophobic view- views that everyone will shout down so as an ally mm. it's almost more important to call out those in those small injustices that you see because they are so symptomatic of an issue within the bigger system you know yes yeah saying that someone's a or that they you mm. know it's, it's a little thing but why aren't you saying the word lesbian why aren't mm. you saying the word gay why aren't you saying, <laughs> sure. why aren't you saying that because yes it's not a bad thing. It's just something that we don't feel confident enough to say, you know, oh, you know, did you know that Ruth's mum, you know, it, it was from Singapore? That's, mm. but it's, like, <laughs> yeah. you, it's so strange. But it, this yes. is what my heart sank actually again day. My son came back from school and I said, oh, you, you said he was playing uh, with Zach and I was trying to go, who is that Zach? And, and it was one of your, black friends and and he went and it was like it was like I shouldn't have said black and I was going but Zach is proud of being black his parents are proud to be black Mm. don't feel like that's a bad Mm. thing why would you think that's a bad thing but we do genuinely you can see people just going and that's how bad and systemic and all that sort of thing it is you know um so yeah my heart sank when he did that and I just wanted to talk to him more about this um so that he kind of genuinely appreciates so much people's diversities and 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 just and also talk to them about how they feel about it too because I think that's really important it comes Mm. from a good place though it comes from the right place and that's why it's almost kind of harder because he doesn't want to say something that's offensive so you you know you got to appreciate that but it's it is very hard it and everyone's just got to be open and have a conversation and feel a bit uncomfortable Mm. I think you're right yeah yeah sorry Ruth no I was going to say that and what I love is about the young people in um LLDC um is that some of them have genuinely said if I'm not making someone someone uncomfortable about this um I'm not doing the right job and they are genuinely really championing stuff within the organization having those difficult conversations challenging people in calls because I feel like I've lived with it for so long that i I get, I freeze. I feel too embarrassed to call it out. And and then Romy, sometimes, as you say, sometimes you go, I just don't have the energy today, mm. Dad, whatever. But they, mm. they have the energy to do this. And I'm just so, I'm just so impressed with them. They're just brilliant. Mm. I, I must admit, my son's 21 and um, he impresses me uh, being, you know, very, very open, very open-minded. I mean, I, you know, my, I'm hoping my parents never watch this. It's unlikely, but both of my parents are really quite major bigots. So I'm quite glad that in just a couple of generations, it seems to have turned around. But then I meet some of his friends and think, no, it's really not sorted, you know. Um, So I think we've still got a way to go. I've just spotted in the chat, which I've just found and opened, sorry. (laughs) Zoe, hello, Zoe. Um, She's just said, I'll, I'll read it now because I think we'll move on otherwise. She said, I think it's important to call things out, but also that we can't rely on those who are experiencing discrimination to raise it, which is, I think, exactly what we've just been saying. It's unfair to expect people to be the representative for their race, sexuality, et cetera, all the time. I think that's the exhausting bit of it, isn't it? I feel like we need to work on allyship more, recognising that people who don't experience these things on a daily basis may not only have more power, but actually more energy, yeah, than someone who faces microaggressions all the time. I think that's so true. Um, And Nicola, hello, Nicola. um, Her youngest said something similar recently, and she was recommended a book called Our Skin, which she's read to him. I never thought at four they could be so open-minded, but that's a really great uh, idea. It's just dealing with these things as they arise, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I think the allyship is is really important, and I'm not sure people really often know where to start. I mean, on a kind of more personal one-to-one level, what what is useful in the workplace maybe particularly? You know, what do you find helpful, not just sort of 
you know, on a, on a kind of formal level? How, how can people get involved and help, ra- you know, raise your points, um, fight your battles, I suppose? You know, what, what are the practical measures that we could all be doing? Do you want to go first, Ruth, or shall I? <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> well, I mean, there's there's been a fair bit that we've done at work. Um, FPCR have been brilliant, really, in in how how they are, what they'll what we send round. We send lots of educational information. We we've done a couple of events. We've done a fundraiser bit. Got little rainbow flags. I mean, I try to be really visible. I think it it's primarily for me it comes from a place of thanks in that the landscape industry has been so good to me when I came to uni I came to uni with a boyfriend and and things quickly I'm not going to say descended things quickly changed (laughs) (laughs) but I came from quite a bigoted household and it was just somewhere to be accepted so I think that's continued for me so I think it's it's about visibility very much um and being able to not necessarily promote but to have conversations and for mm. people to be interested so I think I think that it's that open nature of conversation that's just so key and understanding as well that some gay people don't want to be open not everyone mm. has to do this not everyone has to talk about their heritage it's mm. about if you feel comfortable to do it then do and know that you might make a difference to someone else. But if you don't feel comfortable, just be you, you know, just feel okay with that. And I think that's, that's a really important point to make when you're talking about advocacy generally is that, Mm. you know, no one should feel pressured to, to be anything that they don't want to be. Mm. No, I think that's very true. And I think what we've managed to do at work uh, at LLDC is, is create some of those safe spaces where people will come along. So our Bay Meaning group, we have a lot of people who are quite visible and kind of run the group and it's all great. And then there's people who've come along and just sat in the background listening um, and then feeling more confident that eventually, you know, they feel comfortable to share and mm-hmm. talk about their background. Um, so safe spaces definitely is really great if you've got enough people to create something. I mean, we're lucky we have quite a lot. Um, I think it's quite funny that our LGBTQ plus uh, group has more allies in it than people who are uh, <laughs> a bit too characteristic, but everyone's very keen to be kind of involved. And, uh, <laughs> they need to get important, don't they? Do they? Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, so, it's so important that actually allies are almost more important than the minority, which is mm. ludicrous yeah. I'm saying that, as I'm saying minorities are important. But, you know, in, in order to get effect change, you need to have more people on side. And also there was a really interesting point you made earlier on when, when you said that you felt like if you were saying something in the BAME group that people would roll their eyes. Well, actually, if an ally is saying what Jane has just experienced isn't acceptable, mm. their opinion irritatingly counts for more because it doesn't come from an emotional place it doesn't come from a place of persecution it comes from a place of seeing something independently and saying that nah, that's not okay so those mm. people outside of the minorities are just so important to affect change it is yeah so we need to get them on side i would agree yeah. and sometimes we've had discussions before big meetings and gone hold on a second who's thinking the same stuff so that we know in that meeting we can back each other up quite frankly Mm. and um that's also nice is finding your allies before something going i'm a bit nervous i'm going to have to raise this i don't think my voice is strong enough on my own are you you know are you with me almost and it is really powerful when that works well and Mm. yeah it's been huge for me for this pride month stuff we've done the amount of support and it just makes me feel so lucky and that's silly. I shouldn't feel lucky. Mm. It should just be. It should just be what it is. It should be life that everyone feels like they're. But if someone, if someone asks me about my partner instead of my husband, it's like a tick. It's like this mm-hmm. immediate little thing that they're aware that I might not fit into the heteronormative box, and that just means acceptance. So mm. they're really small things that people can do to change how you feel on your day to day it's just massive that's really interesting i don't know how we're doing it but but 
these comments are coming in before we're talking about them. I've just seen one from Keith. Hello, Keith. We all know Keith as well. <laughs> and he says, choosing your battles is important, but it can be a struggle letting some of the hurt just pass you by, which I think is very true. Yesterday, I spoke to a restaurant. Uh, oops, sorry. Hang on a minute. I've just lost it. A restaurant. Uh about, sorry, after emailing about a booking for my partner's birthday and was told, oh yes, I remember your email. It was about your wife's birthday, which is exactly what you've just said, Jane. I deliberately used a gender, gender neutral term as that feels safest, but we ended up having this odd conversation about my wife as I didn't want to correct or offend her or make it awkward. Isn't, this, isn't that the way this all goes, you know? But I ended up feeling I'd betrayed him a bit. I mean, that's just awful, isn't it? And actually, I hope Matt won't mind. <laughs> When we spoke before, um, Ruth, Jane and uh, Matt and I, just to sort of talk this through and, um, you know, decide how we would how we would sort of formulate the session. Afterwards, he came off and honestly, Matt, you looked a little bit sort of rabbit in the headlights. And, and he just said, you know, I just feel like I'm I'm the problem or I'm part of the problem, you know, young white male. And uh and that's awful as well, actually, <laughs> you know, just this sort of feeling of what do you say? When do you say it? How do you say it? What's the right thing? I mean, it, it, it is quite tortuous sometimes, isn't it? To just feel confident enough to step in there and maybe say the wrong thing sometimes, but from a, from a good place, I think. Yeah. Sorry, and Matt. You know, <laughs> you know what makes it even worse is you could say one thing to one person and it would be acceptable and you could say another thing to another person and it would yeah. be acceptable. So, yeah. you know, I've had conversations with people where I've used certain terminology and it's been absolutely fine, had a similar conversation the next day and someone said, actually, I find that quite offensive. And, yeah. Oh, okay, well, you know, and that's just what we've got to, you can't, ex you can't really predict that. And no. It just kind of is... It is what it is, and you are going to get some stuff wrong. I get lots of stuff wrong, and that's just yeah. how it goes. But we're all only human, aren't we? You know, so I mean, uh, and, and, you know, putting people into boxes, that's the worry that, you know, mm. you just assume that they're going to feel like this. And I mean, there's a myriad responses because we all have completely different backgrounds and, you know, reasons for whatever response we give. Mm. Um, and I think th this comment on this slide actually uh, goes to the heart of you know, what we're talking about really at work, particularly that, you know, the vast majority of people understand the impact and understand the negative impacts, particularly on mental health, but so few actually want to talk about it confidently and comfortably at work. So I think, I think you know, that's, that's just a bold fact, but it just, just does sum up really exactly what we're talking about. Yeah. And I think this next point about, you know, worrying about making others uncomfortable, it, it is a privilege you know, I think you, you've both mentioned before, we, we kind of need to get over that. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it's the privilege that are feeling uh, uncomfortable often. So, mm. yeah. Um, and I think that last point really bothered me. You know, the, these biomarkers, that, that are actual physical medical responses um, to people who don't feel they can be them. I mean, that that's particularly about being in the closet. This is their words, not mine, but you know, it could it could apply to anything, couldn't it? And it was um, actually, Jane, when I spoke to you and Rowan, I've told you this before, when we had our CPD meeting in Birmingham going back a couple of years ago, and we were just chatting beforehand, and you were talking about um, the effect on your mental health and all sorts of other areas about just not being able to be you, not being able to be open, not being able to talk at work, you know, being in the closet and how we all have a right to, you know, just be able to be, do, say, you know, who, who we are. And it was really powerful. I haven't forgotten that sort of two years on and it forced me to publish a thing on mental health on LinkedIn, which I'd been mithering about for about six months thinking, no, I can't do it, you know. So it, it's very, very important, isn't it? Yeah, I don't think you can underestimate the importance. And I don't necessarily think that means that you need to be, you know, it's not like just wanting to go out and talk about, you know, my girlfriend's this or women or anything like that. It's just more mm. not having to check yourself. I know when I've worked in smaller practices it's probably been I felt more it's been more of an issue because in a small room because I mean you know what landscape architect firms are like you can go from a firm of 100 people to one of three 
and you're kind of not quite sure where the other two people stand in the room that you sit in and you don't want to say anything that's going to make anything awkward and you don't want mm. to be so it's quite hard to hard to know sometimes how much you should or shouldn't say but that younger version of me that didn't say I regret that now mm. because I think actually when I think of you know, I used to refer to my partner at the time as he. I was going out with a girl. So why, why did I do that? Why did I feel the need to make that lie to make everyone else feel comfortable? Mm, yeah. It goes back to what Keith's just said, isn't yeah. it? That that awful feeling afterwards that you've, you've let people who are very important to you down completely yeah. um, because of that discomfort. Yeah. Yeah. That's where we're at now. We need to challenge. We need to make people feel not need to make people feel uncomfortable. I'm not talking like weird jokes <laughs> and stuff like that. But I mean like we need to have this open conversation. It, I think we mm. all need to be uncomfortable until we can all be comfortable. Yeah. Yes. I mean? Because that's mm. the point. you don't feel uncomfortable because you re you realise you're in a privileged position where you don't have to. We were mm. talking about um to my son and another uh, cap Zach again I suppose um and just realizing how uncomfortable um his life is being a black boy growing up in northwest London versus my son who looks very white and I'm gonna we're gonna have to give up the fact that I know that my son will have to find that uncomfortable mm. being the white middle class boy in northwest London I'm gonna give that up he will have to do that he will have mm. to because I want everyone to feel as uncomfortable until we know that we can feel comfortable again you know just that crazy thing um i was gonna say something else i've now forgotten what it was <laughs> sorry. you are on holiday ruth i think that's forgiven i can't remember anything if i'm not working i don't know what happens to me i'll fill in quickly uh yeah. with nicola uh, i've got a comment about actually sort of more gender based um but obviously we are all women talking about this regardless of anything else and uh, nicola says that i found since i spoke up about the gender pay gap and being a young mother the amount of stories i've heard are truly shocking that we haven't moved on in 30 years i, I can definitely agree with that having a 21 year old son i don't think it's actually moved on at all um and it's really important that this is addressed and more people feel confident to come forward and it's not just landscape architects it's the majority of the construction and society construction sector and society as a whole actually i think our sector broadly construction is one of if not the worst sector for the gender pay gap so i think we are unfortunately um all part of that um but i think you know it is in incredible how slowly i think the point there is some of these things actually move on and on that last slide i don't know if you if you recall it but you know the the gender balance of ceos in the FTSE 100 it's gone yeah. down from seven to six i mean it's it's not getting any better and the government stopped gender pay gap reporting last year because of covid so nobody was actually even required to report so it, it, you know th even these last couple of years nothing's really changing at all on that score i think that's got a lot to do with the attitude of just putting up with it and cracking on mm. like you know, kind of by our nature i think women are a lot more they're a lot less likely to call stuff out it's because well actually i've got 101 other things to do and well you know it is what it is and i'll sort it out at some point but the point that nicola made about um was it maternity leave did i see something pop up about maternity as mm. well Yes. Um, I think that that, all those things, I, I've i not got a kid. I don't realise that. I don't know. And I'm probably not going to go and look into it. But, mm. I mean, mm. that's not something, but unless people highlight it, unless people say, I mean, the difference with part-time work and full-time work as well is another big one. You know, yes. the difference in pay and obviously more women work part-time because of childcare responsibilities. It, mm. All these things yeah. need to be highlighted and... I don't think my friend are. who is Hong Kong Chinese via Vancouver is absolutely convinced we should force men to do the same amount of maternity leave. And then we would see how the cha that changes <laughs> society. Because genuinely, you know, you have a gap, you, you know, you watch the trajectory of two people, one is woman, one is man, and then they take maternity and then you just, you just can watch it happen. Mm. Whereas if, it, if it, you know, the government force that she's absolutely, and she's thought, I mean, you know, she's, incredibly intelligent so she's thought this through to the nth degree and we had a like 
I don't know, like an hour conversation about it, going, really? You think this is good? And then I was, by the end of it, I was going, no, Charity, you convinced me that that yeah. would make a huge difference to the world if that Are happened. you making placards by the end of it? Yes, <laughs> yeah, so I wanted to go out. <laughs> New ones. Yeah, absolutely. The well, that's... I remembered was um, not being bringing yourself to work and even to the religion point, because I was talking to someone who's mm. an atheist, and she was working for um, a Catholic uh, charitable organisation. And in fact, some of the time she had to lead prayers in some of her work. And she just couldn't tell anybody that she was atheist. Eesh. So every yeah. moment of every day, it must have been, re- I mean, yeah, I don't know. Yes. So, yes, there are people even on a religious basis just not being able to bring themselves to work. Their whole mm. self that conversation. No, that would be very hard. Yeah, I I think I was just going to mention, I think in um, Iceland, that is pretty much exactly what's happening. That um, I think it's the first country where more care is given by fathers than mothers often in society and, and everything obviously supports that in in terms of uh, financial benefits, um, paternity leave, all those sorts of things. So um, I believe Iceland is now classed as Scandinavian. So it's definitely all, all going that way. And I think Nicola put something on LinkedIn the other d- day. She'd found out about what happens in Sweden <laughs> with childcare and uh, wasn't very happy about <laughs> <laughs> all of that and the uh, comparison with us here. So these equal- inequalities are absolutely everywhere. And, and things like that, actually, you know, there's a lot of research now that goes right through to women having very poor pensions comparatively. So, you know, it is your entire life, your entire career and and even into retirement are impacted by these things. So, yeah, I, do, I don't think we can minimise them at all. When, when uh, society is rigged, to pro- to benefit cis white men the mm. most, and it is you know it is based like that. It's not saying all men are bad. That's not what this conversation is. It's saying mm. that our society is set up in a way that minorities will remain a minority. But you know what? If all those minority groups join together, if if those people said actually you know what I'm going to stand up for this person even though I'm not this, mm. if they said actually I'm going to advocate for that advocate for them even though I'm I'm not planning on having a child but that doesn't mean I don't think women should have fair maternity if if we don't all stand together nothing will change and that's the Mm. whole point of conversations like this highlighting these these inequalities these disparities and getting people to act on behalf of someone else because it'll make everything better for everyone Mm, definitely I think I think you've both been very clear you know it is about being vocal it is about being active it is about um you know just making making your views clear and be, and being there for others isn't it I think it's you know it, it needs to be for everybody because all of these inequalities just pretty, must pretty much affect everybody at some point in time um, we haven't even begun to touch on things like socioeconomic stuff or class or, you know, that's a whole other can of worms. Um, and I think um, I know there are quite a few people from the Landscape Institute diversity group listening today and, and joining in. Um, and I know there's there's more and more activity, particularly in this niche. Uh, and, and there's an awareness of where things are good or bad or, you know, where, where work is needed. And it, it does require different ways of tackling ev- every one of the things that we've been talking about. You know, there is no sort of one size fits all. Um, I think, you know, we we have to call on more and more people to sort of put their point across and and be clear about the specifics of what they've encountered, because you can't just have a blanket that, that you know, that will um, cure everything. So it's it's everyone coming together, but we we have got to equally be very specific, haven't we? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, do you think outside of the Landscape Institute um, that there's an even greater issue? I mean, I look I look on sites and things like that, and just you know, my skin crawls to be honest. I mean, what what do we do if we're sort of getting to feel a little bit safer in our Landscape Institute bubble? I know there's still a huge amount of work to be done on many areas there, but but what about you know experiences in in the bigger world? You know, do, do you see them just being sort of exaggerated? These issues that we're talking about, or do you, think, are you not close enough to it to worry yeah, so much? I think there's certain sectors that are definitely worse than others. 
And certainly I'm lucky enough to sit on the sort of client side of lots of things um, mm. and, and, you know, through procurement routes and making sure that you're um, thinking about what you're purchasing, what is going on and, and analysing things in bids and tenders to make sure that there is a sense of equality or, or routes in terms of, you talked about social mobility, which is very much championed by um, my CEO, Lynn. Um, mm making sure there are opportunities and how equal that opportunity is and how and going beyond um, just saying, oh, this is really open by absolutely targeting and kind of saying, let's get the message out to where we need to. If we have if we know our analysis says that there is an issue with a particular group just not applying or not, you mm. know, having that a good gender mix or whatever it might be uh, what we're looking for, you've got to take the action, I think. And I think sitting back and just going, oh, we're very inclusive and, you know, wonderful, you know, is just not enough anymore. And I think mm. that's happened over the last year or so, that that's mm. just not enough. What are your views on positive discrimination? It's just come to me because I'm always asked this. It would just be interesting to to know, you know, if it's a tick box exercise and, you know, you're going through some recruitment and you found at the end that you'd been um, successful on some some grounds that maybe uh, were to tackle diversity in a in a particular company, it, whatever that means, you know, how how would you feel if you um, were subject to that, or would you think, well, it is the only way now to make changes? Well, I think positive discrimination just yeah shouldn't shouldn't happen, but there should be positive action to make sure it's as the best you've got the best lot of candidates for recruitment as possible mm. that is good and loud thing we have a great debates about blind recruitment um yeah. at work and i i think it depends on the maturity of your people doing the recruitment process who is doing the um the analysis and and then there needs to be checks and balances by others to check mm. that something's going wrong because quite frankly when i read something where i it's not blind I'm often thinking, oh, that's really interesting. That adds a different dimension. I know that they may have, you know, gone through this and this is, and then mm. you start thinking about that a bit more. When it's blind, it's really weird. You can almost go the opposite way because we know that men invariably, the statistics fill in an application form way better than women, you know, and we know that, that you know, some the, some public sector jobs, certain minorities will, will not be able to, you know, won't um, present them, themselves in a way that matches that, um, mm. organization quite so well there's loads of statistics about that so it's it's a it's a really really tricky one but yeah not just positive discrimination but positive action to make sure you're definitely getting getting to the talent you want because we want diverse talent yes we want people with you know who um might tick, might tick the box because they have a disability but my god they bring so much mm. to the conversation when when they're in the room it's just yeah I think it's not just to the conversation. Sorry, Ruth. I mean, there's there's evidence. You know, I didn't put it on these slides because it wasn't really relevant. But there's relevant. Uh, sorry, there's um, evidence that diverse boards, for instance, which isn't really what we're talking about, but you know, those companies with diverse, particularly diverse boards in every way, outperform. You know, pale male stale boards by I think something like twenty to thirty percent financially. So that you know, we it's it's not just box ticking. I mean, there are valid, extremely good reasons, wh whichever way you want to look at it. And but it's also about getting those people at the top to see that, and often that means see where the monetary value comes, see how, and understand it as well. That actually, mm -hmm. you know, and that's 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 quite a hard. That all kind of comes back to the advocate, um, the allyship thing, and the education element as well and not just sitting in your comfortable you know comfortable box and just thinking well you know we've always had these sorts of people so we should always do that and I think very much with landscape architecture and design and working in practices and that sort of thing it's it's hard when you're hiring from university and the main pool of people that are applying are white middle class kids because what do you do yeah. then you know how because they're qualified and they're good <clears throat> so it's you're exactly right. Positive discrimination isn't is positive action. Is what what we need, and that's getting more BAME, more socioeconomic groups, everything like that in, into landscape architecture 
early mm. and engage and feel like they fit because at the minute they they don't because they don't see people representing them in our industry in the same way and no no a hard thing to, that is a hard thing to change and it will take a lot of time but there's no reason we can't do it it just means we've got to stop talking and start doing yeah <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, absolutely. Um, Nicholas put another comment on which I think she's probably still seething. Found out that <laughs> Swede, you can read this yourselves, but Swedes pay £20 a month for full time child place in nursery versus the UK 1,090. I mean, it just it beggars belief. But I think, you know, in terms of diversity and equality, um, that, you know, that's a starter, isn't it, for sure. And it, it was fascinating when I spoke to my CEO, who's Norwegian, uh, must be about three years ago about this. He said that, you know, Norway is known to be a very wealthy country and everyone assumes it's oil and gas that are responsible for that. But actually, he told me, I hope I get this correct, that 12% of GDP there is down to oil and gas. I think it was 84% is down to having a fully engaged workforce. Um, and that means, you know, everybody can work. Women can go back to work. They can afford to work full time. You know, they have very good care and they have very good uh, sort of social net. Um, and it was fascinating because that's not what you take from a comment like that. Um, you know, that 20 quid a month would make such a difference. Can Thank you. you. So what childcare would be like here if you're paying 20 quid a month it would be some old old person sat in weather spoons with a kid on a rain wouldn't it that would be it i don't yeah it doesn't bear <laughs> thinking about does it to be honest <laughs> no, I know. Thank you, Zoe. Um, she's put a link up on the financial benefits of diversity. And yeah, I mean, we're, we're talking about a fairly narrow field here today, just the three of us. But, you know, there's obviously, you know, much more scope um, to to talk about maybe next time. Um, you know, this 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 isn't ending, is it, anytime soon? So um, I, I think we'll need to sort of draw it to a close fairly soon actually i've just got a few slides to uh to sort of follow up and let you know what's happening next but what what would you both like people to take away from this i think most of the people listening um are already engaged already have their own reasons for listening today but you know when it when this goes on to youtube we do get a lot more views from i mean we don't know who so what particular aspect would you like to sort of leave with people um, following our conversations. Do you want me to go first? Sorry, Sorry. Go shall I pick on oh, one of you? Yeah. Okay, yeah. One, mm. Just make, I, I guess the thing really, if you want to do one thing is just challenge, maybe not even challenge one person, speak to one person, highlight something to one person, something you see, if you're engaged, you should be aware of different challenges that people in minority groups face. So spot it and say it. Mm. That's that when because when before we did this, you were asking about some potential questions, and one of the ones mm. that I put was, if you have you ever seen discrimination at work at whatever level? Yes. And then second question, did you call it out? So that's what you do, and that's how we that's how we start doing it. Not in a really combative way, not in like a sassy kind of Karen way. I mean, in a in a way that is an educational way and, and challenge people to think a little bit about how someone mm. else might be experiencing. Mm. No, that's, that's really valid. Yeah. And yeah. And I would do the same thing. The thinking thing is the big thing for me. Feed that curiosity, feed that openness, feed that kind of just thought process. Cause I genuinely feel like I had a massive catch up in terms of thinking over the last two years. And it was just thinking from other people's perspective and and all the things I've observed, all those little microaggressions, all those little things I didn't act on, mm -hmm. just collect, collect, I've just collected them all in my head and gone, wow, there's a lot of it out of there. There's a lot of injustice. And we just need to be, you know, the more people are aware of it and the more people who get angry and go, I'm feeling uncomfortable and whatever, the mm -hmm. better. So observe what's going on and think about it and think about how it feels and think about why that doesn't feel that doesn't feel right because so mm. much we're blind to it we've gone oh it's been like that for years why sh why should it be any different now yeah and I was going no it's just really not acceptable so no yeah, I think yeah I exactly to observe look think about it mm. 
I, I think that <laughs> it's a really good point. And I, the only one I can think of is that they reckon that it's going to take something like another 120 years to close the gender pay gap. Sorry, Nicola, <laughs> you, don't, you definitely won't want to hear that. Um, but, you know, it would be very easy to sort of roll over and say, <laughs> you know, yeah. why bother? I mean, that's not the point. Um, I've just got a couple of things more to read out. I know everybody can read these, but I feel like it, just in case someone's missed the chat uh, tab or something. Um, and I think, um, Alia, your your point, I mean, that somebody said recently, and I don't know if it's a good one or not, but in, in, what was it, diversity is being asked to the party, inclusivity is being asked to dance. And that was the very first thing that I thought when I read this. It's it's important to notice more than just having a seat at the table, absolutely, but being truly included and welcomed um, so that you can unapologetically be yourself. I think that's really, really important with a diversity of views and feel comfortable challenging systemic issues. And these are absolutely, as we say, they're completely systemic. Uh, and then thank you for great conversation. Um, and then Alia, again, considering more from a political context where tokenism is very much present, being a person of colour doesn't preclude one from being racist. Actually, that's very true as well. I've, I've encountered that. It's much more nuanced. Yeah, it is. I think nuanced is the word here. And I was, that's a much better way of saying what I was saying about five minutes ago. I think it is all those, all those subtleties, isn't it? And, and awareness. So, yeah, thank you. I'd better start drawing this to a close. We've only got a few minutes um, left to go. But I really hope um, that, that you'll see how what we've talked about today uh, is very much aligned with this SDG and that we can all make changes by being aware of everyday inequalities in our lives and speaking out, offering support and allyship. And so some of this particular SDG 10 is more tangible to you now. I know we know that people often ask, how do we embed these things in our lives or our working lives? Well, that, that's the whole point of this FICA series, really, to find ways to bring them alive and, and show people how they can contribute to making a difference. Um, so I hope you've, you've found that today. We'll be continuing the conversation. Um, I think most of you probably are signed up for the newsletter, but if you're not, please do on our contact page uh, or about us page and we can make sure we keep in touch with you. Um, we have a lot of posts uh, in social media and on our website about things like inclusive public spaces and that does bring in some of, some of this topic. Um, social media, particularly Instagram, if you're not signed up, you might like to do that. And... Uh, very much hope you've enjoyed this today and thank you for giving up an hour um, to join us, particularly you, Ruth, on your holidays, mm -hmm. but, obviously, but obviously everyone. We know there are so many online opportunities these days competing with all of our time. Um, but don't forget that this does count towards your CPD commitment <laughs> uh, for the year. So you can you can tag an hour of that exactly. <laughs> or, you know, we have we have more formal CPDs if you're if you're in need of even more. I think the year's just closed, so you might be all right for a little while. But also please do remember that as as um, panellists and attendees, we have this amazing competition and prize of a trip to our new factory next year, we hope, COVID allowing, in Norway, so that you can see uh, firsthand how we incorporate uh, these SDGs into everything we do. And our upcoming FICAs are here uh, next month. We talk about SDG 15 on the subject of biophilic urbanism. So completely different topic there on greening our cities with a couple of real experts. And in September, we hope to be live or at least um, uh, hybrid from the planted uh, exhibition event in King's Cross for London Design Week. So if you can make it down there, please do. We'll, we'll be there, hopefully. And do please get in touch if you've got any thoughts on the conversation today. And uh, I know there's quite a few things coming into the chat. Um, so, you know, please do get in touch. We'd love to continue the conversation. We'd love to make sure everybody's continued to be supported in all the things that we've talked about. Um, so, you know, don't let this just be it for, for, for this whole topic. And thank you again to everybody, particularly Jane and Ruth, my colleagues, Matt and Jack, who are in the background, concealed, helping out with all the background functions. And uh, it's Thursday, not Friday, because we usually hold these on Fridays, but go hell or good, you know, have a great weekend. And we hope to see you next time. <laughs>